Good morning, everybody. Um, well, and welcome to this workshop. So this workshop is titled uh, The European Copyright Reforms Proposal, uh, which impacts on users' fundamental rights, which is uh, a topic that has been this is being quite discussed um, these days, as you can see, I'm guessing through the posters that have been set up here, that I'm trying to read, uh, but, um, but thank you very much for the illustrations. Uh, my name is Maud Sake, um, I'm a public policy manager for the uh, Twitter Association called the Computer and Communication Industry Association, so we represent internet companies and, and the digital sector in Brussels. And Washington, and we've been uh, well involved on the entire copyright reform um, in Brussels for several years now. Um, let me introduce you to our main participants to these workshops. So we have Eva Lepic uh, for Wikimedia here in Estonia. Uh, we have also Samuel Lorincari, um, who is the head of European Affairs at eBay. And I know eBay is always a weird company about copyright. You never really think about eBay in that context, but Samuel will explain us to why it's actually relevant for, for his company. And we have Jake Beaumont-Nesbitt, who is the executive director of IMMF. It's the International Music Managers Forums, and so can um, explain to us the perspective of artists uh, on that debate. We also have uh, Wolf Ludwig at Co-Moderator. Uh, thank you very much for your help. Um, as well as Arpine Sahakian, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, for the uh, remote moderator. And our rapporteur for the end of uh, the workshop is uh, unfortunately not able to make it live. So I will summarize the session at the end and we will send our feedback as well to you, Dick, in the afternoon. So, um, before starting what can be a very long and complex debate, I would just wanted to give a bit of background as to why um, we set up this workshop and, um, and the main topic on which we will try to focus uh, because it's such a broad uh, and wide topic. So perhaps the background um, is that uh, about two years ago now, the Commission decided to try to create what it's called the digital single market or DSM for short. The idea was to try to uh, bring down barriers uh, in the digital sector between the European, the European member states. And so the Commission launched quite a few proposals and initiatives over, over these past two years. And one of them was around copyright uh, and the idea to modernize it, to make it fit for the digital age. And so many different proposals were actually published by the Commission. We chose to focus on one of them, uh, published last September. Its uh, official title is the Proposal for a Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market. And this proposal is now being reviewed by the European Parliament and the Council. And there is actually an important vote that is happening tomorrow at the Parliament, if you um, are following those um, debates a bit more closely. Um, but even if we focus only on one proposal, um, that proposal covers quite a few different uh, areas, from text and data mining to um, new exclusive rights for press publishers online, from um, uh, undermining the um, um, limited liability regime of platforms, so by making, for example, licensing or um, filtering requirements, to copyright exceptions, such as education, for example. So there's a lot of topics um, to cover, and we're happy to discuss them, of course, uh, but we will start to, uh, by focusing, I think, uh, at least an important part of the debate on uh, the issues of um, of what we call Article 13, which is the idea of uh, filtering of liability of intermediaries online, uh, licensing requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then, of course, we are happy to broaden it a bit for debate. If you have any questions on um, publisher rights, for example, or copyright exception, such as freedom of panorama or education, um, I'll stop there um, right away and uh, leave the floor to Samuel first from eBay. Great, thank you very much, Maud, and uh, thank you for always introducing me as the random guy in the room. No one knows why. 
It was a very weird room to talk to because there's no one in front of me. There's people on the sides, but I'll try to sort of look around. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what eBay is and what we um, do in 2017, and then I'll talk specifically about the copyright proposal and our uh, concerns about that after that. So uh, most of you will obviously remember eBay, um, the online uh, marketplace that essentially created, invented, and pioneered e-commerce in 1995. Many people remember it um, as a sort of online flea market of the 90s, where you would sell old stuff that you don't like, no longer use, especially in markets where you don't have a cited platform. Uh, but we quite strongly evolved from a consumer-to-consumer -consumer marketplace into a business-to-consumer marketplace. So around 80% of the around $90 billion of sales on our sites these days comes from sales of predominantly small businesses that leverage our platform to reach consumers um, beyond their sort of local communities. So um, we identify ourselves as very much a small business platform and as an export platform. So what we see in terms of the small business usage on our platform is that technology fundamental, fundamentally changes, revolutionizes the uh, nature of commerce. So whereas back in the days a small business um, couldn't participate in international commerce in any other mean than tapping into the supply chain of a multinational company. Technology has changed that so the distance doesn't matter. A small business can uh, to interact and transact with consumers everywhere in the world um, directly. So quite concretely, what we see is that 93% of the small businesses that trade on our platform are actually exporting. And 40% uh, of those into four than more, more than four continents. So these are really micro-multinational companies that are um, uh, embracing the digital opportunities and creating jobs and growth in their local communities um, while being global and, and, and serving customers everywhere in the world. And of course, the same applies to the customers who are enabled to reach a uh, product variety and inventory that, that was not possible before. Now, you may wonder what has this anything, what, what's the link to copyright here? Um, is of course, it's, is that I'll do the standard blurb wherever I go and promote our platform. But the, point, the, the bottom line is that uh, a platform uh, such as eBay, an intermediary platform, that essentially puts the technology that connects people using the platform at their disposal, enables economic activity and supports the economic development in a society at large. And, and here's where the copyright proposal comes into play because it it's essentially, uh, it's essentially undermines uh, the ability to do so because the platform business model that we, for example, have put in place depends very much on the fact that you are not liable as a platform provider for the infringements of your users. A technology platform, the, um, the, the ability to scale is what makes you competitive. So in our case, for example, there are more than 1 billion listings on our site at any given point of time, and around 10 million new listings coming on the site every day, which means that a manual review of the, of the all the aspects of legality of the listings is impossible. Even if you would have 100 million people reviewing those listings, they still would not be legal experts in all the areas that have an impact on, for example, the legality of a product. Think of copyright as one, but then there's product safety, then there's consumer law, there's chemi chemicals law, there's product specific like legislation, there's age verification issues. There's, uh, there's a whole bulk of legislation that applies to any product being sold, um, hence making it impossible for, uh, for an intermediary to check the leg leg legality of um, uh, items being sold by the users. So hence the principle that users are the ones that make a decision to act through the technology that is being provided. It's very important. And it's very important also in the copyright proposal. So let me be concrete what exactly we're concerned about in the copyright proposal. As I mentioned, for an intermediate platform such as ours, it's absolutely critical to be able to rely on the fact that you are not being held responsible, liable, if someone abuses your platform. However, that exactly what the copyright proposal is, is doing. So, Essentially, our three concerns about the copyright proposal is one, it turns all hosting service providers, so think of any intermediate platform, from a host that hosts information content uploaded by users into the publisher of that content. And that exactly is the, that changes the, 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 the whole dynamics of the transaction um, and the legal liabilities related to that.
So essentially, we would be held, we would be considered, in a way, the retailer, or in, a, in, in the copyright terms, the publisher of, for example, pictures associated, associated with listings. Secondly, it reinterprets the e-commerce directive. The e-commerce directive is the legal cornerstone of the internet, which establishes this very principle that you're not being held liable for the infringement of the users unless you're aware of the infringement. It reinterprets the e-commerce directive in a way that excludes any modern intermediate service provider. So I, I still haven't been able to come up with any business that would actually be able to benefit from the e-commerce directive um, if the Commission's proposal would be adopted. And thirdly, it imposes a filtering, filter, filtering obligation on platforms. So in addition to, to, to um, these um, first two very crucial points, um, the, the, the proposal also obliges online platforms to put in place technical filtering obligations or uh, technical filters to, pre to prevent um, infringements of happening. Um, you may wonder, are most items being traded on eBay rather protected by trademark than copyright or patents? Yes, but there's also a, um, a, many, a lot of the content that we host on our site is copyright protected. So I mentioned we have about one billion listings live on our site at any given point of time. Usually those listings are associated with four or five pictures of the product that people are selling. So that, 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 that makes around four to five billion pictures that we host on our site that may or may not be copyright protected. In addition to that, copyright is extremely broad and, as, 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 and vague, so it keeps evolving with case law. Um, it also differs by country. For example, in France and Germany, a product design, so the, how the product looks like, can be protected by copyright in addition to design right. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll give you an example on the worst case scenario of uh, application of law that actually exists today. So in Germany, the German Super Supreme Court ruled um, that we had a, um, a, a stay down obligation on a copyright violation. And the case dealt with uh, a children's chair called Stocke, um, well, called Trip Trap, manufactured by a company called Stocke. So it's a Z-shaped chair. Um, my daughter has one as well, excellent chair. Um, but Stocke claimed that a competitor, so another company that produces chairs, had produced a chair that looked too similar to the one that they are manufacturing. Um, filed a takedown request to our service, claiming that it's a copyright infringement. We took the listings down because of the liability risk. That's what we do when we get notified. We're obliged to take things down. But listings reappeared, so the competitor kept selling these chairs that looked similar, they didn't claim they're Stocke chairs, but they looked similar to the chairs that Stocke was selling. Now, imagine what an intermediate platform can do there. So it puts us in a position of being a, essentially a design right judge or copyright judge in that context. So customer service people, people that review, get these notification, should, are actually, in, at, at the very moment, sitting in front of a desk comparing two pictures and making the judgment, is this similar or not? And is this a copyright infringement or not? Um, gladly, this applies only to one brand in a very sort of specific circumstance with, with some uh, traffic generation elements to it as well. But if this would apply across the board to, for example, all the 30,000 brands that participate in our rights and all program, it would uh, make the intermediate platform model um, impossible. And I know I exceeded my five minutes, but one more point is that what we keep hearing from both the rights owner community and the commission is that you guys shouldn't worry about this copyright thing. It's not about eBay. It's about YouTube. It's about uh, uh, music. It's about more audiovisual media content. It's about a uh, so-called perceived value gap discussion. Um, but it is, essentially. As I mentioned, if you read the text, if you apply it, as it would apply, uh, then it would indeed be ridiculously broad. It will include uh, any kind of online intermediary that hosts any kind of content, not only those that are perceived to be at the middle of these political concerns. I'll pause here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Samuel. Um, as you can see, just a, a, a couple of words on, on my side. One of the main debates we have here, um, at, at least at the postal level, is whether that proposal actually changed the e-commerce directive and, and changed the, li the liability of platforms. Uh, the proposal says that um, if you, um, for example, have different category uh, of product and if you categorize the uh, content uploaded by the users and potentially you are directly now publishers and not more, and you're not merely a hosting provider benefiting from that, from the e-commerce directive. So at least that is the position of eBay, if I understand it correctly, and that's usually the position more broadly of the digital industry in Brussels, position that is being fought against by Rice Holder and the Commission that considers that what they are doing is not changing the e-commerce directive or the liability regime. So that's, I think, one of the main debates we are um, having right now. And uh, I think we'll have the opportunity to um, go back to the Stoker case a bit later because I'd like to have a bit more detail and to, if you have them, so how many people actually uh, have to review, um, have to review every day your platform to make sure you're not infringing uh, the design rights of those, um, of those chair. But I will just uh, hand over the mic to you, um, or except if you have one, que one question. There's no question, just a tiny, tiny statement. I would also mm. like to underline that even if it wouldn't be that broad and eBay wouldn't be covered, it would still be a very, very bad idea to do that for, to YouTube and the other actors, because we don't want to have these private judges over what is allowed content or not on the internet. That, that's an inherently bad idea. That I think a lot of people would agree with you <laughs> on that point. Um, I'm just going to hand up the mic to Eva from Wikimedia. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about, also talk about this uh, content filtering uh, theme uh, as it concerns uh, Wikipedians. <laughs> so, as you all know, the, uh, Wikipedia is a platform where volunteers are creating free content. So actually, we monitor ourselves. Uh, we uh, monitor the content uh, that is produced by volunteer editors. And uh, so it would be great waste <laughs> to create an automatic system for filtering the content. Um, because everything, we, uh, everything in Wikipedia should be under free license or in public domain, so it would be quite pointless to apply technical devices for filtering. Also, uh, once platforms are forced to make these technical uh, implementations, then um, I think this will not stop there. These devices can be used other ways, which are connected to human rights more directly than filtering uh, copyright infringements. So, Wikipedians are uh, very well informed about copyright problems, uh, much more than ordinary people. <laughs> So, uh, this uh, new system, if it will be in force, would be detrimental for, for our work. So, what else? There are some other con concerns. Uh, uh, the proposal by European Commission did not uh, say anything about uh, freedom of panorama. So this is right to disseminate images of the buildings or sculptures or artworks permanently placed in public places. Uh, the system is, well, every, every country has it its own way. Uh, we would really like to see it harmonized because uh, in Baltic states, 
we have only uh, allowed to use these images non-commercial, which means we can't use them in Wikipedia. Uh, and actually, we, um, this uh, form of uh, copyright doesn't allow to put these images in social media. Okay, the other thing was, I, I wanted to stress out that um, uh, there have been court cases about um, artworks in public domain which somehow get uh, copyrighted when they are di digitized. So, the uh, German Museum sued Wikimedia Deutschland uh, for putting uh, images in public domain uh, to Wikimedia Commons, which is our file de depository. And uh, these were old paintings, which should be in public domain, but nevertheless, the museum actually won the court case. <laughs> so we are concerned that uh, our our Cultural heritage is um, is not free for all, and uh, uh, I know there has been made uh, amendment proposal uh, during the process in European Parliament now, but uh, we can't be sure it will it will it will be implemented. So maybe I will continue later. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I think it's, um, again, just one additional word for me. I think it was quite interesting in Brussels when I attended the panel, and I remember, I think it was a representative from Wikipedia. I might be wrong, uh, but I'm pretty sure it was Wikipedia uh, that was asking the Commission whether, according to the new proposal, uh, Wikipedia was um, included in the scope and so would have to implement those filter and would uh, be li directly liable for content uploaded by its users. And it was an interesting discussion with the Commission um, and um, representative of rights holder arguing um, legal basis that this wasn't the case. And Wikipedia saying, well, I've got, I've got seven lawyers telling me, the, telling me otherwise, so who is right? It was just at the beginning of, um, of the process, but I remember thinking that this was going to last months and months until everybody was actually agreeing. And I'm not even sure that anyone would actually agree at the end of the process about the interpretation of what has been uh, voted. And uh, in terms of freedom of panorama, I think we'll have the opportunity to get back to it as well a bit later. Um, but it's quite an interesting discussion especially for me being French and the all idea of the Eiffel Tower picture and all of that. Or I'd like to know what I'm actually able to do, able to do and to post online. But I will uh, hand the mic to Jake right now. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I'm from the International Music Managers Forum. A music manager is somebody who works for the artist on their business side. The artist does the creative, we do the business for them. So we work for them, we carry out their instructions. Um, when we come into this discussion about copyright, we think of money. We think this is how we get paid. This is what allows our artists to spend days in studios or out the road, that they're getting paid from the music that a lot of people are enjoying and a lot of people are making money from. So it's really important for us to protect monetization of usage. Copyright, the right to make copies, it's kind of a redundant term and has been evolved over the years into various little sections. As each new technology comes along, the music industry, so not the artists, but the intermediaries and the people around them, has done a really good job of developing new ways of creating money from new uses. And the current reform process going through Brussels isn't really a reform, it's more tinkering at the edges and thinking from our side, from the music side, how do we make money? Um, sitting between two platforms, between Maud who represents a bunch of platforms and between eBay, we don't care. We're not interested in the platforms, whether Samuel can scale and things like that. But the thing Samuel said at the beginning was that he's a marketplace for small businesses and he allows export. And so although we're not that particularly enamored of companies like Google, Facebook, eBay, etc., 
what we're in love with is the marketplace that they've created and the powers and ability that they've given us to disintermediate, to remove intermediaries, by which we would mean collective management organisations, publishers, record companies. If you're just doing the sums, remove stakeholders from the pie, there's more money left for the artist. So the music industry obviously doesn't necessarily have a, a great belief in disintermediation. But, and it's also not something that the artist particularly uh, are aggressive about. We're not sort of all the people that we work with and help us, we're not particularly saying we need to get rid of them, we need more of the money. But when you look at the massive disruption that's gone on to intellectual property and the way that content is traded online, the consumer experience is radically transformed. The ability for a consumer, instead of buying a compact disc and having it tethered to any device that they could play that on, a player that maybe they had in one room at the home, maybe they didn't have a portable version, to now they can access any music on their phone anywhere in the world at any time for a flat fee. That's uh, an amazing form of change, disruption, whatever you want to call it. We haven't seen those changes in the B2B side, only in the B2C side of music. The fear that we have, therefore, with the current copyright process is it will impact marketplaces. It will impact the, the, all the points that eBay are making. You could apply those to platforms like SoundCloud, like YouTube, and Facebook are increasingly going to be focused on video and music and pushing that way. Um, so we're really concerned about our ability to reach the marketplace. A thing that I've been hearing through Eurodig, particularly yesterday, was, was about intermediaries, where intermediaries seem to refer to the platforms. We think of intermediaries as the music industry. Um, there's a, where the music industry discusses the copyright reform, we discuss around money. When I come here, I hear concerns about freedom of expression. We don't really talk about those in the music industry. We have this phrase, the value gap, that was invented by the record companies to suggest that the platforms have a lot of value extracted from music and they don't pass that through. The amount of intermediaries between the artists and the platforms and the inability of a lot of the big platforms, including platforms like Spotify, to actually make money out of music because they're retaining quite a small share compared to what the retailers used to retain on uh, physical products on CD and vinyl, makes it kind of hard for us to see what this value gap thing is. So value gap appears to be a simplistic phrase by the music industry to say, we want more money. We're not sure that there's more money on the table. We're also convinced that having this big marketplace, the exports, ability for small traders to get into the platforms, to get onto the space, to reach audiences, that's how you grow the, the market. So just asking short term, give us cash, create rules that would uh, reinforce our business model rather than try and find ways to grow the market and increase the total value. We think that's kind of looking at it the wrong way. But artists think about freedom of expression. They care strongly. Away from music, they care about the ability for people to put their opinions online, politically, socially, culturally. This isn't just a music form of freedom of expression. Artists understand that intuitively. With Article 13 of the copyright reform process, what would happen is platforms that host content uploaded by users would have to filter that content. And this initially, from an artist's perspective, sounds reasonable because it sounds like what you're saying is the filter will find the stuff that an artist owns and will make sure then that the artist has control over how it is used online. So a platform like Spotify is 100% filtered already. Everything that's on there, they have a license for. There is an approved process through which the music has been uploaded. The problem you get when you get platforms where everything is fully licensed, so they're not these open, chaotic, wide marketplaces that anyone can jump into, is the most dominant, the strongest players um, end up with control of the market. So we see physically offline, we see all the high streets, the high street in Tallinn is starting to look just like the one in Helsinki, the one in Brussels, the one in London, similar stores, similar shops everywhere. 
We're starting to see that online with the playlists that platforms like Spotify host, that you're getting global music, global uh, singular products that are, are pushed worldwide. So when I speak to our Estonian uh, member organizations and Estonian artists, they really struggle to get their music onto a platform like Spotify, onto their global playlists. So I was speaking to a Estonian artist yesterday who'd managed to get onto the New Music Friday on Spotify out of Helsinki. So this is great. They, they should then, in theory, start to get traction in Finland. But their music was put on for one week on a playlist that most of the subscribers are just listening to it like wallpaper. It's becoming very difficult for artists to surface and reach engagement through these massive platforms. And so little tokenism of we played an Estonian artist once, we put on a playlist for one week, up against the wall of Anglo-American, US, UK, Canadian, Australian content that's being pushed, um, it's really not making much impact. So we're seeing a global playlist in the same way that we see these homogenized high streets where there's the gap, there's H&M, there's Starbucks. We're seeing that online with music. And that's the unintended consequence that we're afraid of with the filter. We don't object in theory to people who host music checking to see if they've got stuff that's ours because we might want to get paid for it or we might want to take it down. We do object to a system that would hand control to the major record companies who by threat of will pull the licenses to a service like Spotify or by the fact that they have equity in a service like Spotify are able to control what's played, what's promoted, what's pushed. So we see these rules that are pushed as uh, Article 13 has pushed as the poor artists aren't getting paid, this will help them get paid. We don't understand how it helps us get paid. We do understand how it re-entrenches the old business model that hasn't been disrupted, the B2B bit. From the consumer's music is radically changed. From our perspective, we're still stuck with the old control and system. Um, so competition is important and freedom of expression is important, but when we discuss the copyright reform process, we just talk about money and value. And nobody in the debate from our side has come up with an explanation of how control of what is heard, what is played, helps us get more money. It's almost like we're just angry. The platforms have a lot of money. We want more money. Give us control, because we can't pass a, a law that would say, give us more money. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, perhaps um, then we'll guess open the debate for question. I will perhaps just start with one, and then um, um, to Jake. Actually, if one of the platform you quoted quite often was Spotify, I'm guessing if I understand you correctly that you're worried that what you see on Spotify is going to happen to platforms such as YouTube or Facebook if those filters are implemented, and that's not something uh, you would like to. What would you perhaps better? Uh, want uh, for artists. I know I've heard a lot of the word transparency uh, being, you know, um, told again and again in debate in Brussels. I don't know if that's something that would make sense for you as well. The transparency thing, so artists doesn't know who used their music, doesn't know how much money it generated, can't really say, hey, you need to pay me that. Um, the transparency thing can be done away from copyright reform. The technology is moving along so rapidly that it is easy to check micropayments to pull the data through. The thing that we had in the old business model with uh, money for you shipped 100 CDs, you had no idea how many CDs had been manufactured. And this is not like speculation on my part. This is properly proven cases, usually in the US, that record companies would would create an extra shift. They would create more, they would manufacture more CDs and more vinyl than they told the artist they had manufactured. So you would ship more records than you were told had been made. So more money would come back than you could ever expect. It's very simple with a digital platform for the platform to be given a login to the artist as well as to the, to the record company for the platform to report, not the money. The money can keep going back as per the commercial agreements, the record company, but the data can go directly to the artist. And the artist can then use that data 
to leverage other opportunities, to reach out to fans, to understand where they are, what they're interested in, and to start to make money from other areas such as ticketing, merchandise, and, and just general engagement. So the transparency thing is an issue and is a problem, but we can do that away from copyright. The, the, the difference between a, a Spotify and a SoundCloud YouTube area is this user-generated content word. So the music industry will talk to Brussels as we are professional artists. And the problem with it is, is user-generated content is all of you guys, if, if you did anything creative, you're not real artists. And it's really hard to put into boxes a full-time professional artist like Bob Dylan and anyone in this room as not artists because Elvis started out by going into a studio in Memphis to make a record for his mum. He didn't think he was a, a global revolutionary artist. If he was doing that today, he would probably post a, a clip for his mum on Facebook. This is how artists start. This is how this is the, the link to eBay, is you start off as doing something creative, and then at some point you think, hey, I might try this a bit further. But you don't have the revenue to give up your day job. So the user-generated content thing, which is generally used to describe everything other than music includes a huge amount of artists and the Beatles when they were earning their corn and learning their trade in Hamburg if they were doing that now fans would be filming that putting it on YouTube and it would be spreading rapidly so the Beatles and Elvis can quite easily be dumped into user generated content before they were signed the problem of creating an ecosystem where you have to be signed to get access and exposure on a platform like Spotify is it prevents the artists from getting away from the record companies and finding alternative forms of finance. Uh, yes. Uh, so what you said earlier about uh, we're now able to access uh, any music uh, from around the world uh, to a flat fee. I mean, that's not really true. Uh, today we actually have geo blocking which uh, actually means that the uh, artists have to, or the platforms that provide the music, have to pay uh, several different licenses for different countries, which in terms uh, means that most of European consumers actually only get access to the American music because their uh, platforms can actually afford uh, these different licenses. So I hope and assume that you're against geo-blocking. There's two systems. So the geo-blocking applies for the fully licensed platform, and that's optional. So what we, we personally, I think it's stupid. Like, I, I wouldn't want to block any of my artists from... My artists, I don't think in terms of geography. So I'm not like, hey, we'll launch in Estonia, but we won't do Latvia, and we won't do Croatia. You would just want to go globally because you're looking for fans of that sort of music. You're not looking for Croatians or Estonians. So I would generally tend to go global, but there is value in rolling stuff out. If my artist is touring and they won't get to Zagreb for two months after they've been in Tallinn, I might want to delay the release. So in the short run, geo-blocking can be a useful tool for a promotional campaign. So we wouldn't want to say we oppose it and everything must be open all the time immediately. But sort of more to your point, what's happening is there are platforms, if all the music ends up as it's only on a platform where the system runs as you described, then the geo-blocking is done not because it's a strategic short-term goal of the artist around the music first being released and first heard. It becomes a way of controlling price and content. What, what I would do at the moment as an artist is use a platform like Facebook or SoundCloud or YouTube and I would control the rights and we wouldn't use geo-blocking. So the two systems, the open free one, which is towards the eBay side of things, geo-blocking is irrelevant. The, f the fully licensed stuff, which is what the filtering of Article 13 would move us towards, the platforms and the big players will decide about geo-blocking and the control and choice will be removed from the artist. It's a bit nuanced, but I sort of agree with you.
Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Eero. I'm from the local chapter of the Internet Society and Pire Party, actually. Uh, so, uh, my question is as to, as to legislation, uh, what would be the proposals uh, for, uh, I don't know, nowadays legis legislation that wouldn't be from the 20th century? What, what would be the key points? I mean, uh, should it be redefining commercial, commercial use or uh, would we need to tackle uh, what are the commer commercial use cases for, um, for the legislators and for the courts to decide on the copyright infringement? Uh, what would be the uh, legal aspects that we need to uh, analyze first and come up with co uh, conclusions? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's so entangled without, so music is just one form of content that's being affected by this, the, the copyright stuff. Across music, it is so confusing. I'm quite specialized in the stuff I do and I have a reasonably good understanding of how the rights would work, for example, with the Beatles for Lennon and McCartney as authors or for John Paul Ringo and George as performers. But the consumer, the fan, just takes it as the Beatles. And then once you go into those, that binary, who wrote it, who performed it, within that there's different bits. The performing rights can go this way and other people have other bits of the performing rights and the author's rights can go this way. And it all needs to come back together again into usage rights. We need to just throw out copyright, create usage rights, figure out how we monetize them and make them very easy for consumers and services, users of music, to understand and to grab everything. We should, on our side of the fence, be doing all the division, not saying to the rest of the world, if you want to use music, it's a jigsaw, and you've got to know all the pieces and figure them out. So there needs to be a radical, massive overhaul, which is really hard to put into a specific policy proposal based on what's out there now. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, I have a question for, for you from uh, the eBay. Uh, even though you as a platform wouldn't be reliable for the copyright infringement of your users, do you think, still think it's uh, right that the users themselves are uh, like a, a subject to copyright infringement when they're putting up just like a picture of a chair or something that they want to sell? Uh, I know that the Culture Committee has made a proposal about uh, making an exception to user-generated content, which would actually, as our uh, pictures here, uh, it will legalize uh, a whole generation and all of internet culture. So what do you think about that? It's a, it's a very good question. And currently, um, we, of, of course, need to comply as in or facilitate the compliance with the legal frameworks so our terms and conditions would say that you know you as a user need to make sure that you have the legal rights to you to distribute the content that you're putting on our site meaning for example if you plan to sell a chair that you need to have the right to use the picture you associate with the listing however what we see is a lot of abuse when it comes to copyright so um, manufacturers of course want to control the distribution of their products think of a sport shoe manufacturer has a selective distribution system, supplies products only to uh, retailers or middlemen as part of the selective distribution system. However, those contractual arrangements are no, never watertight and products get outside of the distribution system. And then independent retailers may get a, um, a shipment of products, they buy it from a middleman and then want to sell it to end consumers. There's nothing illegal about that. It's, a, it's just outside of the contractual framework of the manufacturer. If an independent retailer goes on our site and sells those products, perfectly legal, authentic, nothing wrong about those products, then what we often see is that the manufacturer will come to our site and notify copyright infringement based on the seller using a catalog picture that the seller has downloaded from the manufacturer's website. So in essence, what the manufacturer does there is enforcing their contractual arrangements in the selective distribution systems in an effort to keep the prices high by abusing copyright uh, law. Um, so, so, um, so bottom line is, is, I suppose, is that 
you know, in that context, will encourage users to comply with with, with the current law. However, we would welcome any uh, modifications that would prevent such such as be abused. Eva, I don't know if you have anything to add regarding a copyright exception for user-generated content. Uh, is it something important for Wikimedia, for example, to implement or to have and to see in copyright reform? All we do is user-generated co uh, content. And um, uh, I've heard that uh, there have been different proposals uh, of amendments on, on user-generated content. And they initially, initially, there was a proposal by Cultural Committee, uh, which would uh, allow um, this content uh, non-commercially. Uh, but I know that there is also uh, a proposal to, to, to allow it commercially, so that this content may be used commercially. So, which is much better. Because in Wikipedia also, the, all, all, all uh, there is must be allowed to use also commercially. So. Thank you. And you have a question? Um, I would like to circle back a bit um, to the question what would the modern copyright reform look like? Because I just spent the last five days with uh, 25 other uh, amazing young people here, the copy fighters. Um, maybe you have seen the position paper here or online on copyfighters.eu. And we have thought about e exactly that question and we think we came to the conclusion that we have to overcome territoriality because in the internet there are no borders and um, it is insane that we have different rules in different countries. At, le at the very least, there should be a harmonization of the exceptions and limitations in copyright in all of the EU, but better a um, single European copyright title. That we have to overcome geo-blocking, that we have to allow fair use, um, and uh, many other things that you can read in this paper. And I think that these should form a basis, that this would be the common sense basis to then circle back to other questions. For example, when we're talking about um, can we regulate uh, how much money we can, uh, can get from the intermediaries? Um, yes and no. Like maybe there is a monopoly situation where YouTube doesn't um, give you a big enough share from um, their incomes. Maybe that is the case, and maybe we should have that discussion as well. But we cannot have it on this basis where um, everyday culture is criminalized and uh, where yeah, usage patterns um, do not reflect, um, are not reflected at all by copyright legislation. Thank you. Perhaps just a quick question on, on my side. How do you see then uh, the debate evolve at the European level on that, uh, on that um, topic? Are you any kind of hopeful at all? I mean, there's been a lot of proposals, I think, I mean, working in that, uh, I mean, on, on that debate for months now, I'm a bit more discouraged uh, on that point, to be honest, but I don't know, maybe you have another perspective, and is there any kind of campaigning action that uh, you're planning then to try to defend those views? Um, there are a bunch of complaints going on. I think we, or maybe not all of us agree, but most of us agree that we are starting off from a very bad proposal that includes insane things like ancillary rights for pre press publishers. And obviously we have to form alliances to, to kick them out again, but we don't have any such alliances yet to um, figure something out that brings us a step further, that makes copyright actually or um, brings us uh, to the promise that Jean-Claude Juncker made to break up the silos of, of national copyright, that, that we are nowhere close to that. And I think we should form such alliances and that's, that's like our attempt to do that. Um, yeah, check it out on copyfighters.eu. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any comment from you guys on, on, on more broad copyright reform, territoriality and all of that? I'm guessing. Uh, a thing that Julia Rader from the Pirate Party said was make copyright invisible, and I think that's quite a good thing, certainly from our side and from the user's side. Um, the, the excellent point that this gentleman just made about detaching the money conversation, does YouTube pay enough? We know that Spotify overpays, and we also think that the price they charge the consumer is too high. Um, which is, is sacrilege if you say that in front of a record company or a publisher. 
But um, if you try to grow the market, make more money, I used to spend at least 50 euros a month on CDs and vinyls. My sister didn't. My sister bought three a year. So she's now being paid, asked to pay 10 euros a month, 120 euros a year, and she used to spend 30. So we haven't really bought in variable pricing and things like that. So this whole thing is, is YouTube paying enough, blah, blah, blah. They pay about 55% of the money over to all of us on the music side. Spotify pay about 80%. Spotify can't make money, YouTube can. Are YouTube selling the adverts for enough? I wouldn't think that the music industry knows better than Google how to price advertising content inventory. So the percentage thing, somewhere between 55% and 80% is right, but we have no economists looking at it. It's nothing to do with copyright, it's competition, it's monopolies, it's things like that. It, it, that can be removed quite easily from the conversation. I fully agree, and actually wanted to comment on that. Isn't, as in, and this is maybe more of a personal comment that if you look at the uh, the compensation discussion, discussion, then as the rights owner, you obviously have the choice whether you want to monetize or you want to have content be, to be removed from the platform if someone else has uploaded it. Now, <clears throat> now if, if you consider that you don't actually have a choice, you, you need to make that money, then you need to look at the competitive landscape and whether that platform has, for example, a dominant position, and you need to look at other areas that allow maybe it's a competition issue. But, um, but uh, I fully agree that this is not something that should be dealt through copyright law. Yeah. I really like the young, uh, angry people, the copy, copy fighters here, but uh, I have a question uh, about fair use. So how do you fit the uh, concept of fair use into European copyright tradition? To that first. Um, I think um, yeah, we, we can't just tear up our systems with exceptions and limitations from one moment to another, um, but we could form an open norm, an additional exception from copyright that allows future uses of the currently already available um, copyright exceptions and um, like have one that is future-proof and lets it up um, for the future to, to, to see uh, whether there are new forms of use, for example, for educational purposes um, and, and, and so on. I think it's not impossible, um, but we don't even have this discussion, unfortunately, most of the time. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to sum up uh, or make a mental note to myself uh, on what points exactly do uh, these actors here agree upon? I mean, um, does uh, every one of you, uh, for example, agree upon these uh, copy uh, uh, seven points? Or, uh, um, as, as I understood, you do uh, think that um, uh, a bit too much uh, is put on ISPs and uh, intermediaries, um, so uh, that should be like softened, softened uh, as by legislation. Uh, so that was one point. Uh, and what are the uh, other points you do agree upon? And is there something here that um, that you sh uh, you need to uh, hold on to as as uh, I don't know. Um, right holders or, or managers. Um, and, uh, and as to the law, uh, the people who are making copyright claims, they do have uh, um, the law backing them up uh, as by giving the possibility to make the claims. So um, just softening legislation, just uh, saying that it isn't right and it should be like um, it should be abolished. Uh, that's, that doesn't seem to be your claim. So, uh, so, so how do we balance the uh, the uh, possibilities of uh, of copyright holders to make the claims and modern use of uh, of different uh, different sites and uh, eBay and what else? So what are the key points we do agree upon uh, as to these actors here? Uh, does everybody agree upon these? And should these be impl implemented uh, as by European legislation, for example? 
Uh, my turn to say good luck. Uh, <laughs> who wants to start? <laughs> You've got them in front of you. In, in such a, uh, in the privileged position to be the only one with a paper on, James has one as well. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll just comment on, on a couple of these, uh, because none of, not all of them are relevant, uh, directly relevant for our business model, but um, geoblocking um, happens in digital content and it happens in tangible goods. So in tangible goods in the retail sector, um, it is perfectly legal for a supplier, sort of a manufacturer, a brand, to um, restrict the territory in which a retailer can sell products. Then the retailer is bound by agreement, by contract, to only distribute the products in that territory. However, as a consumer, you see the retailer and blame the retailer for restricting your access to that product. Um, but in reality, as I mentioned, the the, the restriction happens one step further down in the supply chain. And I think that's similar to the music sector as well. I don't know the value chains as well, but, uh, but that it's often that the, um, it's the, um, the, the step below the consumer surface where the distribution agreements um, restrict that. Now, obviously, if you make those, those, those restrictions illegal, it will change business models. I mean, people have built their businesses in, in, in the tangible goods uh, context. Uh, manufacturers and suppliers have built their business models around the ability to restrict um, distribution in territories and uh, by doing that, essentially maximizing the money they're making off the market. However, Europe is a digital market. Europe is a single market and should be a digital single market. So we are a strong supporter of removing those restrictions to have to generate authentic and real competition um, in a wider European market and allowing consumers to have access to products um, in a wider European market, but also allowing uh, retailers to trade everywhere in Europe and reaching those consumers. Um, I think there's more complexities related to this in the, um, in, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the, for example, music sector. So I'll let uh, James comment on that a little bit later. Um, the other point out of the seven points I want to address is, uh, is the one on intermediaries. I think um, you guys are spot on in identifying that intermediaries play this important role in facilitating um, economic activity, but social activity, artistic activity, and, and their ability to do so and innovate should be um, should be protected. Also, welcome very much the uh, focus on users' rights. Um, again, a similar um, uh, similar sort of problem exists in the retail space. Think of a small business, a three-person company running an online shop out of a warehouse in Tallinn, and then if they have to get their products removed from our site because of an abusive copyright notice. These people are without revenue for a week. Even if it's, even if it's wrong, the notification is wrong, and we'll put the listings back up once we've clarified that, seven days without any revenue for a small business retailer can be very detrimental. So this is not necessarily a human rights issue, it's an economic rights issue, but still very, very important to look at from the, from the user's perspective. This is a really nice, pa nice paper, <laughs> and uh, I uh, uh, fully support the ideas of uh, uh, remix culture and uh, education and open access. Uh, uh, the current proposal uh, has limited the educational exceptions only to the formal institutions of education and uh, and this is really bad when we like to talk about lifelong learning and other things. So, yes, it should be much broader and involve the informal forms of uh, giving education. So. Um, point seven on this ancillary right for press publishers, the author, music authors organization for Europe, EXA, hate that. 
because they see ancillary rights for press publishers, which has nothing to do with music, as the thin end of the wedge. They then consider that publishers will come for more rights and encroach further and further on the artists. So it's interesting that we first looked at that and we are like, it's nothing to do with us, not our problem. But increasingly our artists are saying, hey, watch that. Um, territoriality, this point that every, there should be a single global understanding, that's really important. That's part of this whole make copyright invisible thing. Of you should be able to just know what it is wherever you are, not worry. Uh, the geo-blocking thing uh, brings up the term thing. The, the point I made earlier on is in the short term, in the first year of release of new content, you might want to use geo-blocking as a short-term method to control promotion and marketing activity to help that content. In the long run, there's not really an argument for geo-blocking, but what that does do is bring up this subject of term. When we're not looking at this copyright reform process, the term, the length of copyright always comes up. One of the ways of simplifying copyright would be the term for the copyright for Lennon and McCartney is far longer than the term for the copyright for John Paul, Ringo and George. The performers have shorter rights than the authors. Just harmonizing that somewhere would be simple, but when you start to talk about term, two things have come up from our move from physical products to digital. So when we used to sell a CD up front, you guys would pay us 10 euros on the day that you bought it, and we would have that 10 euros whether you listened to it ever again, we would have it for life. What's now happening is we need to wait years sometimes until you've listened to a track on Spotify enough times for us to hit that 10 euros from you individually. So it's taking us longer to get our investment back. And so then that makes us think, well, maybe we should extend term. I'm, I'm not proposing that, but it's, it's a consequence, an economic consequence of how consumer behavior has changed. Possibly term should be opened up and reviewed. And one of the interesting things that comes up with term is in the old model, uh, people didn't spend that much money on CDs and physical, and they would buy through fear of missing out, peer pressure. They would tend to buy new releases by what we call frontline artists, current artists, things that are happening now. You would want to go into your pub, your school, wherever, and say, hey, I've heard that new track by the new artist, and you'd want to talk about that. You wouldn't have much spare cash to invest in catalog artists. What's happening on Spotify, you're in on a subscription, you can move without an economic barrier between checking out all of the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and Dolly Parton without any loss, any economic cost versus listening to the new releases. So suddenly from most of the money that you guys spent going on new artists, it's flipped. And most of your listening is going on checking out this great back catalogue of artists. So the amount of money that's coming from consumers to the music industry for new artists has collapsed. This doesn't bother the big record companies because they have, they own the stuff by the older artists and they have it on terms that are far more favorable for them than the new stuff. So maybe there should be a, a look at the way that monetization occurs with copyright for new artists compared to old artists. That's a long, the, uh, what I'm trying to do there is say that the the consequences of the digital disruption and the change at our end and at your end, I'm treating you guys all as users, as consumers, is quite extreme. And the term thing needs to be, you need to look at that as well within your, that needs to be point eight. Thank you. Just a final comment and for on my side and then, yeah. Absolutely. Just on the, on the idea to have, um, um, I mean, really personally, I think, when you see the debate going on, I mean, everybody is saying, well, we need a unified European copyright. And I think if I still work in that domain in 50 years, I will still be hearing we need a European copyright, a unified European copyright. Um, just the way you see this debate every day, my personal point would be to try to focus on things that we think are doable at this time and in an incremental way. Uh, I think arguing for unified ex copyright exception across the EU is clearly something that we should already have today. So so it's something that we need, I mean, to push and it could be normally, I mean, something that realistically could, could be potentially achievable at one, some point. So why not do that? Uh, and then, I mean, I'm just saying, like focus on, on a few issues that you think could be potentially 
uh, reachable in five, ten years, and then build on that rather than perhaps argue for a huge copyright Big Bang, which we know is quite unlikely to happen. That's just my point. And then I think there was a question over. Okay, I'm the first. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Bogdan Manole. Uh, I come from uh, Romania, from a civil society organization called Colapti. And I will also um, uh, follow up on what you said and ask for a reality check of what is happening today. So today in Europe and tomorrow in the European Parliament, we will not discuss about fair use and we will not discuss about remix. But we will discuss about the ancillary copyright and it's closer to reality as you would think. So, so now it is the time to act. So um, even if we have these nice discussions here, and the, the discussion is going very much one way because there are no collective societies involved probably, uh, I think it's important to look at what we can do tomorrow. And tomorrow, and actually today, we can do something for tomorrow, that is to, to call the MEPs and to tell them what we think about the proposals that we have uh, now on the table. And I think that's more important and, and it, 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 uh, uh, you can do it. Uh, there is a website uh, talking about how you can do it. There is a website called savethememe.net uh, which has uh, a tool in place where you can freely call your MEPs uh, or you can just send them an email if you don't prefer to call them. So that's something that is it's really useful and, uh, and that's the, the bit that you can do today in order to, to bring the discussion forward. Now, and I also had one question because I was, I was impressed about your position uh, of, of representing the, um, uh, the music authors. And I think that uh, in this European copyright debate, we often miss the, the position of the European artist, of the European creator. And I'm not talking just about music. It can be also about film or documentary films or, or painters. And uh, usually in the debate, this position is always taken by the collective societies. And they always say, you know, we represent the artists. We give the money to the artists. And, and there is no one, I mean, and we participate from a civil society point of view, so dealing with freedom of expression, privacy, and others. But very often, we do not see the, the European artist in this. So, so my question to you is, how do we involve those persons in the copyright debate? Because so sometimes their views are different from the collective societies. Um, exactly as you described, so Collection Society, artist has to register with Collection Society because Collection Society has artists' money. Collection Society does not represent artists. Collection Society will turn up in Brussels and say, we represent the artist. They don't. You guys, um, civil society, platforms, Wikimedia, you find it very hard, consumers, you find it very hard to say the artists, you, you would never take it upon yourselves to speak for the artists because, it, but the labels, the publishers and the collection societies do it all the time. So where the artists have quite a small voice in Brussels, we have no full-time staff in there. All the collection societies, the labels, the publishers have large lobbies in there. Um, it need, you guys need to be more confident in saying we don't believe that these people do represent the artists and to push policy makers to prove that they've spoken to artists, to prove that they haven't just heard from them, someone who turned up with a record label. Because a lot of the artists, if your record label rings you up and says, Google are making a huge amount of money, you're really poor, it's Google's fault, come to Brussels and tell the policy maker, the artists are like, yeah, sure. Um, and what are we doing to promote the next album? And what's happening with this? And when are we going on tour? So it, it's very easy for them to turn up with artists. Policy, you guys have the opportunity to say to policymakers, have you heard independently from the artists when they're sat on their own without Big Brother sat next to them with a hand up their back telling them what to say? Um, I think that's the best you can do. And then, it's, then that creates more opportunity for us to get meetings. So, a um, couple of notes. I'm uh, Sim Duisk. I'm from the Network of Estonian Nonprofit Organizations. So, like a umbrella NGO. Um, first of all, I think that it's like a series of delay battles, or this is how I, I look at the, the whole issue. Basically, there is a technological change. Something happens. The uh, the owners of the copyright and uh, all sorts of um, intermediates, they sort of get left behind and then they try to um, you know, protect their uh, already uh, ancient business models 
against some, something that happened without uh, you know, legal, legal changes. Um, on the other hand, on the legal, legal uh, sense, this is where their, for their, their power comes into, um, into being. They can actually control the, the lawmakers much more better because of the organizations that they have built up, rather than the users or the artists or all sorts of other people who are on the front line of that technological change and just use what is already there, not really caring about the legalities. And this is something that I'm a little bit pissed about because um, in a kind of way, you guys, and I'm surely going to you know, hurt you in, in a little way because I'm you know, just pointing out that uh, because you are the, speaking for the artist here and kind of getting to blame for all, all of this, you are um, trying to delay the, the changes <laughs> just because the, in, in delay in the sense in, in, in that way that um, you, it would be, if the technological change could actually run the full course, it would change the reality so much that it would be forced to, the, the legal sense, it would be forced to come, in, come into contact with the, with the reality, but because it's not enough, because you know, the Ubers and the Spotify's and all of them, they just barely scrape that edge. You know, they, they sometimes are managing to grow big and fast enough that they would be able to, to force the uh, the lawmakers to actually come in contact with the reality, but quite often the already people with power they are just able to delay, delay, delay the future coming into into being. And this is something that uh, when we are talking about all these uh, ancillary rates and everything else, it does look to me as yet another battle that uh, the NGOs are on the losing side because they would be not really able to. Uh, um, they would be able to be reactive, but not really proactive in the, in the way that uh, the collective rights organizations and the rest of them uh, would be able to do. And uh, from the technological point of view, a lot of the changes from the legal point, they either kill off some already passed um, um, system and or are preventing the European uh, um, inventors or, or uh, entrepreneurs into doing something that would actually be useful for the wider humanity. Thank you. And um, we were wanted to answer perhaps just one thing on my side. Um, I mean, you have a chance right now that the proposal is actually at the parliament. And if there is one institution where actually you can make a difference in terms of NGO and users, it's the parliament. It's a lot harder to do it at the commission and council. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, NGOs in Brussels trying to, I mean, launching campaign and all of that. Any support I would imagine for them uh, would be welcome. Just saying, I mean, it's not it's not the solution, but at least if there is one moment when you can actually act, it's now, uh, and we don't have much time uh, actually because it's going quite quickly. I don't know if, if anyone wants to react. I think you, you mentioned Uber, and if Uber comes along and disrupts taxi drivers, puts them all out of work. Um, lowers the wage, and then at some point the low-wage Uber drivers get replaced by self-driving cars and they're all out of work. You do have with technological processes to pause at points and to consider the consequences and the outcomes. With Article 13, the filter that we're looking at at the moment, we're not trying to... We're trying to stop the uh, imposition of technology that's not yet ready. The filter doesn't work, um, so it would be ridiculous to force platforms to use a filter to find copyrighted music because the, the lawyers inside the platforms would say, this doesn't work, let's just not host any user-generated content. So um, we're not, I, I don't think we as, a, as artists, artists representatives, would necessarily always be against progress or for progress or blocking technology or pushing it forward. We just look at it case by case. And the current thing that's before us with Article 13, the technology is not ready. So what we would rather see than policy that, that says how the technology should work, we would like to leave it open and we would like to see the technology evolve without really being challenged and to consider later when we can better get a handle on what it is and what it does uh, legislation. Samuel um, generally, I, I mean, I, I am a supporter of the narrative that, that 
the technology often comes and disrupts the vested interests of vested industries, and, and there's a lot of the sort of uh, the old money and the old links that prevent progress uh, of happening. But I, th I think it's sometimes a little bit abused as well by people that don't feel like they would need to play the same, or play the game with, by the same rules as their competitors. So I think you need to be sort of careful, look at the business model, look at the exact case where the narrative is being used, whether that's actually uh, about preventing progress and preventing technology for putting in place, or is it is it um, disrupting through uh, unfair means or, or, or competing on an unlevel playing field? Yes, uh, regarding the geo-blocking again, uh, what you say about uh, that uh, geo-blocking should be in place, like for, for example, uh, during the first year of release, uh, because like you want to be in control of uh, who gets the music or whatever, uh, that's called marketing. It has nothing to do with legislation at all. Uh, because what, what geoblocking actually does is not preventing the consumer to get access to the music, but it, puts, uh, it places the release of the music in the hands of piracy instead. Because people are going to listen to that music if they want to, and if we have geoblocking, then the artist won't make any money by uh, releasing that music uh, just in one country, because everyone else is also going to download it. So, no. Uh, and also, uh, regarding uh, campaigning about this, I actually try to, uh, uh, to visualize this in, in, the, uh, in Sweden, where um, uh, actually a lot of people still believe that this is legal, but, but I mean, it's not. Like it says, one does not simply make a meme without infringing copyright. And this is a huge problem. I mean, uh, if the European Parliament and the Commission wants to uh, still make this illegal, then they have to pre present this to, to the citizens and actually tell them that this internet culture of yours and this whole generation is making something illegal because people are simply not aware of it. So that's like a huge point that has to be br brought forth a lot more. You, you're totally right, geo-blocking in the first year would be a marketing thing. And you're also right that piracy is a way around it. But different audiences have different levels of piracy or interest in it. So for some artists, it's really irrelevant if they block in a country the amount of users that will access the content through piracy is minimal. And what we would argue is that you need to give the control to the artist to make that choice. You or I might think that they were foolish or making a mistake in their marketing strategy, but we would like them to have the ability to do that. So, nice meme. <laughs> so, uh, I also made one <laughs> recently, <laughs> saying, uh, where is my license? <laughs> and uh, this is uh, what the European Commission has done for years now, uh, starting from the process uh, or, or site they called Licenses for Europe. This is how they perceive needs for free culture or, or, or your generation who wants to to live uh, their lives in internet and, uh, and communicate their ideas uh, via memes like that. And a, a very short comment actually on that. So outside of the exceptions uh, discussion on memes is that your form to publish it is most likely social media that benefits from the e-commerce directive liability exemptions also. Even if you infringe copyright, the platforms are not being held liable, which is exactly what would change with the copyright proposal. So we'd actually have to review that, make sure that you had the right to put it up and then allow it also only in 15 days later um, where no one could see anymore. One last question over there, uh, just one comment and then we'll, we'll go on, on final statement regarding the memes because we're all focusing on the copyright reform but actually there is also an audiovisual reform that is going on at the European level and at some point it's being, you know, now being kind of reviewed but the definition of what a video is actually could cover the meme because it was a moving image without sound 
uh, with or without sounds. And you're like, well, hey, but actually you also cover memes, so you want to apply audiovisual regulation to memes as well. And that's when kind of a discussion started, oh, maybe we should exclude it out of the scope. So I mean, it just copyright is one big thing, but actually there is other <laughs> regulation that is, could also apply to, to those kind of works. Um, so there was sorry, a question at the end of the table, less over. Not a question specifically, but moving away from the debate of what should be included into the proposal, I would like to address the point that many users of the internet are not aware of what copyright is and what the right on the internet are. What do you think should we do about educating users of the internet, young people and adults alike, about what copyright is and what their rights online are, and how to bring this debate more mainstream? Yeah. Is that perhaps first? Well, I think that we should start that, uh, at school, maybe for 13, 12, 13 years old, uh, people are old enough to, to get, the, uh, get the point. <laughs> so elementary copyright rules should be introduced at school. Yes. Why should they care? Who are they? Yeah. And like my colleague said before, it's not a matter of whether it's going to happen or not, it's when. So regardless of what people might think is legal or not, I am going to have access to information. The question is how? <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> Of course, information wants to be free. <laughs> and we all get what, what we need. I'm a librarian. And uh, you know, I send my readers to Liebken Eel. Because if I don't have what they need, and I know they need it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think education about copyright is really a 20 minute lesson uh, and it's really just saying that someone created something and they should be respected in the usage of it and potentially they should be paid for the usage of it and that's it. There doesn't need to be extensive education about all of the glitches and things and that's the point where copyright should become invisible. People should be aware that the owner is an owner and that it's property but they shouldn't have to follow all these crazy things that we try and keep track of. And so good copyright reform would make it invisible for usage. Thank you. We have, I think, five minutes left. I don't know, is there any final question uh, before? Yeah, over there. Thank you. My name is Valentina from a civil society organization in Romania. So I think we're dealing with a lot of um, misunderstanding and uh, inappropriate terms. You mentioned property. Uh, so how come uh, if it's copyright is property, how come it expires after uh, 70 plus years after the um, author is dead? So, and piracy. Are we still in uh, oceans fighting uh, with uh, pirates stealing our treasures from our ship? No, we're not. So um, I think... Um, we're, we're not in a position to, um, to, to be comfortable with, it, with these terms. And uh, a, a sound uh, copyright reform will um, include, uh, for example, uh, additional or empowered um, uh, authors and creators to really have a choice, like, for example, applying open licenses on their work. So that those types of licenses were not uh, be seen as uh, uh, outlaws or uh, a minority of um, authors doing this. Uh, it will be um, a modality to empower the creators. Um, I think this is one of the, the major issues with a, with a sound copyright reform, to give 
actual choice to the to the authors. Okay, thank you. Then I will um, let all of you answer with your perhaps final remarks. And I was thinking maybe as, as part of your final remarks, if you could tell us how you see the the reform going at the EU level, what you think uh, is happening now, what's going to happen. If you are optimistic, uh, pessimistic, I think in terms of final statement, it could be could be nice. Thank you. The property thing is with physical property, uh, leases can expire, freeholds can expire. The duration thing doesn't mean, mean it's not property. You can find any word you want for it. It doesn't have to be property. I don't care. But if someone creates something and they're trying to monetize it, they should be able to, however you define it. As I said at the beginning, I don't like the term copyright because the right to make copies is redundant. I would like to see the language change. So I'm stuck with using the old language. Other people have been bringing up the piracy thing. For us, it's gone, it's finished. There's always been a piracy thing. There was a piracy thing in the physical thing. We don't care about it. It's a great um, flag for intermediaries to use to say, we've got to fight the pirates. And, and then the other side comes and says, we are the pirates and this is what we want. The artists are like, get on with it, we don't care. We're trying to make our business in our space. Um, the point you make in, in terms of summing up about um, the reform process and, and how we move things forward and having, you, you wanted more artists could do open licenses. They can do that now. They have access to things like Creative Commons. The reason it's not used much is because we're still coming to terms with, we've only had them for sort of 10 years or so, YouTube, SoundCloud, things like that. We're trying to get away from artists uh, wanting to sign to a record company, which takes you out of the Creative Commons thing into forms of finance and business where you could survive away from the record company thing. So it's a slow process for us that we're trying to evolve towards. The Article 13 that would bring the filter in would force all the artists away from new models, from Creative Commons and things like that, back into the arms of the record company. I'm quite pessimistic about it because, as this gentleman here referred to earlier, the industry lobbies have done a really good job of convincing policymakers that the industry speaks for the artists. So it sounds like it's in the artist's interest to lock the shop down and not allow the artists access to these open licensing systems. We would like to see more of them. Just a really tiny comment. The contracts that the artists have with the collective societies quite often don't allow them to give uh, you know, Creative Commons usage to some sort of uh, NGO or whatever. Basically, once you have given over the content, you have no control anymore. And perhaps even more importantly, Creative Commons is not an international thing. Uh, several countries do not allow for it. Uh, Iceland does not have Creative Commons. Sweden, I believe, has a right to citation. Just because I, th I think they're out of time, but j just with both your points, is yes, I agree, but in order to... So I'm not sitting here saying we're against that. I'm saying we would like... We understand what's flawed in it, why it's not growing. What we're worried about less at the moment is how do we incubate that, feed that, nurture that. We're more like, hey, we're about to be dragged away from you guys into a locked room with Article 13, and that's all we're panicking about at the moment, and we're quite nervous about it. Thank you. Uh, what concerns European copyright reform? I'm quite pessimistic because uh, the whole process has been quite closed, and uh, there are really few people who know what is going on. <laughs> and then, um, of course, uh, we don't like the outcomes, but we haven't participated in the, in the process, uh, and uh, it's uh, mainly the voice of big companies and uh, big pub publishers, and which is heard and which is written down there as a law, future law for all of us. So it will not be nice. Um, maybe just in terms of, of, of the process and, and you know, what we hope to see um, as next steps uh, on the proposal is that obviously our wish is that it will be radically changed, that Recital 38 and Article 13 are essentially killed or neutralized to the extent that, um, that the very detrimental 
consequences on the internet wouldn't ever come into force. Um, I think civil society has a very important role to play. Um, Brussels is not that intransparent as you'd think. Uh, people are also not that stubborn as you'd think, so they're very open to hear people's views and, and the more sort of public uh, concerns are being raised, public discussion, more um, communication towards policymakers, uh, the better. So I think all of us has also as individuals have a role to play to, to talk to the people that, that we can and our elected politicians to make sure that people understand that this is not just fine-tuning some things and making sure that YouTube pays a little bit more money. These are fundamental questions for the entire functioning of the internet as we know it. Um, and, and the policymakers should uh, stand up to protect it. Now, in terms of in, in what I think will happen is that we'll get a significantly improved text coming out of the parliament. I think the amendments are likely to go through tomorrow, um, introduce significant improvements to the text. So let's hope um, the vote tomorrow in, uh, in the European Parliament Internal Market Committee goes well, um, and, um, and the parliament, uh, Parliament's other committees um, adopt similar solutions so that they, they can negotiate with the member states and, and um, come out with something reasonable. It is a missed opportunity, even if that's going to happen, it's a missed opportunity to really um, uh, reform copyright because essentially we'll, we'll be with a status quo more or less uh, instead of a framework that would really bring copyright to the 21st century. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. We are out of time. So uh, thank you for participating. And I hope it was uh, at least interesting for everyone. Mm. Thank you.